vote according to your conscience as, uh, as you seek to be good citizens and wise informed voters uh, and to do so according to what we believe in your heart is, is God's best for our nation according to his word. Um, I, I do personally encourage you to vote no on Proposal 3. Uh, while we don't endorse candidates, we do talk about issues that we believe are purely biblical. And I understand that there are people that are for life that have differences of opinions on this, so I respect that. Uh, but I just want to, from my conscience, say that I believe that enshrining uh, abortion in our state constitution is, is wrong. Uh, and I also, this, this law has uh, inherent dangers in it. Uh, for one thing, it could uh, eliminate, could allow abortions throughout all nine months of pregnancy. Uh, and it has the potential uh, of uh, limiting or eliminating existing laws and future laws. And it would have to do with how the courts would decide on various issues, but it's a very broad uh, statement and you know, supported by Planned Parenthood, which should tell us something. Uh, they're not exactly a strong pro-life organization. So, uh, may the Lord guide you as you vote, and guide me as I vote, guide uh, our nation. Uh, you just sit because the politicians make a lot of difference in our world. And uh, it's challenging, isn't it? And we're in difficult times. So, let the Lord guide us. Uh, and may we be in unity as the body of Christ as we walk along together. Second Chronicles 7 14. If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my case and turn from their wicked ways. And I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their end. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given us many great and precious promises. And uh, Lord, our, our land needs healing. We all see that. And, and people, committed believers, have different perspectives on various aspects of what that healing should look like. But Lord, what we all know is that only through your life in us, revealing the truth and directing us and bringing about love and a unified desire for the best for all people. So only through that, Lord, that we'll see the transformation of our nation that we desire. So, Lord, we call us to humble ourselves. And Father, this begins with us as individuals. We're so filled with pride. Do we lower ourselves and crucify that pride? Because we know, Lord, you give, you oppose the proud, and give grace to the humble. And we don't want you to oppose us. And so, Lord, let us get low. And as, as believers, we will pray that you'll eradicate pride. We know it won't be completely gone in this life, but oh Lord, humble us. And the most disturbing forms of pride is, is judgmentalism, comparing our righteousness with others as if we have anything to compare. Purge us from that, Lord, and may we be known as a congregation of grace and love, and yet a congregation that upholds your truth. Humble us, Lord. Humble our nation before you. There's so much pride. May we have humble leaders. And Lord, may we seek your face. Your power might be released and bring healing. Where it says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Father, as we come today and come to your table, we ask that your Holy Spirit will move, stir within us, quickening in us both the death of Christ to our flesh and the life of Christ to your righteousness, your righteousness alone. Father, may you grace be with uh, our leaders here at the Covenant Church, with the servant leadership team as they meet this week. Father, may you bless you be with the Covenant women as they meet tomorrow. Uh, as they seek to build strong relationships with you and with one another. Father, we want to ask your continued grace and recovery for, uh, for Ben and for Jim, who are here this morning, for healing for Ron Lyons and Beth and John Dellis and Barney and Bonnie, Ruth, 
little Jameson, shy, because I've got a little more for Jameson. But I also pray for healing for Rose Anderson for the vertigo that she's experiencing. Touch her with your powerful hand. And Lord, to guide us in the election Tuesday. And Father, may you raise up those that you desire. We ask, Lord, that you will fill us with your Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit move among us right now as we come to worship you, to give you glory for all your goodness, for your beauty, for the beauty, your beauty that you've revealed through creation. Father, for your great name and your amazing grace. So we come now in Jesus' name to worship you. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Let's worship the Lord together. Yeah. 
same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. We're getting close to the end of our series, How to Live a New Life in an Old World. On the first letter of Peter, he's writing to a number of churches that are in Roman cities, Roman citizens, uh, Romans who have come to Christ, and he's explaining to them that they are sojourners in a foreign land. This isn't their nation. Their nation is the kingdom of God. This isn't their home. Their home is glory that is yet to come. So how do you live as a stranger, a sojourner in this world until we're with the Lord? Because we don't fit in. We saw that uh, last week Peter was addressing leaders in local congregations and exhorting them to care for and lead the flocks under their care in these urgent times, emphasizing that they were to lead through example as caring servants, not as lording it over. The message last week was leading from below. Peter then addresses all believers, exhorting them to live lives of humility. Our message this week is living from below. We'll be talking about pride and humility. The, uh, the cars that the Bradford family Drives have been famous for breaking down. <laughs> now, I, I don't like debt, so we would always buy older cars and then we'd drive them till they dropped. In fact, it, we, our car broke down so often that our kids just thought that's what happened. You know, break down. I remember when uh, Laura, our daughter, was younger, I, I overheard her telling a friend a story of one of our breakdowns. And parenthetically, she said, you know, our cars always break down on vacations. <laughs> Don't know which cars break down on vacations. And then she went on to tell the story. Uh, I remember one time I drove up to an ATM, and I was in one of those cars that was on its last leg. And it was billowing some blue smoke out the back. And, uh, and when I drove up, the car in front of me was this brand new, beautiful black Mercedes. You know something? I felt really small. I felt bad about my car. I felt bad about me. Why? Well, it was because of pride. 
whether we're on the top or on the bottom, the, the heart of pride is, is it always compares itself to others. Tim Keller, in his book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness, wrote this. The way the normal human ego tries to fill its emptiness is by comparing itself to other people all the time. C.S. Lewis in New Christianity on his famous chapter on pride observes that comparing ourselves to others is at the heart of pride. Lewis writes, this is interesting, this is so good. Pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more of it than the next person. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they're not. They're proud of being richer or cleverer, or better looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich, or clever, or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. In other words, we're only proud of being more successful, more intelligent, more good looking. Pride is the pleasure of having more than the next person. We want to be better than. To puff ourselves up. We want a nicer car, a bigger house, cooler tech, the more beautiful wife, the more successful husband, the bigger salary. And in our pride, we compare house size, salary, beauty, intelligence, cars, boats, snowmobiles, clothing, fishing rods, rifles, I mean, whatever it is, right? We compare. <laughs> pastors compare church sizes. When you go to a pastor's conference, you know, sooner or later you get the question, so how big is your church? My brother-in-law, John, think of me. he's a pastor. He was at a denominational event. He got so tired of hearing that question asked that he began to answer, oh, my church is between five and 6,000. Between five people and 6,000 people coming. So. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy watching their egos just spent. Deflate. And then get one back at the end. Worst of all, we, we compare our righteousness with others. That's what we call self righteousness. We want to be more righteous than the next person. We can do that in church. That was the sin of Pharisees. And you know something? To be honest, there's a little bit of Pharisee in every person. So let's turn to God's word and see what Peter has to say on the subject of pride and humility. After exhorting the leaders who were teachers in the church, Peter speaks to the young. He says, in the same way you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. And then he goes on to exhort everyone. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another. Because God opposes the proud that shows favor to the humble. Here's our first point. All believers are called to clothe themselves with humility. We're to clothe ourselves. Humility should be wrapped all around us. When people look at you, one of the first things that they should see is humility. It's what we wear, so to speak. And this phrase, clothe yourself, is actually, it's a rare word that refers to a slave putting an apron around his waist before he serves his master. And I expect that Peter had in his mind what Jesus did at the Last Supper, the night before he was betrayed. Remember the story, John 13? Jesus got up for the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist, just like a slave preparing to serve. After that, he poured water into a basin, just like a slave would do, and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. You remember what Peter said? The text says, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not, do not realize what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Why is he so upset? Well, he was living out of a paradigm that was wrong, but he had lived in it all his life. And that is that those who are on top are served. 
And he knew Jesus was the Lord. So it was socially embarrassing for Jesus to be serving him. And even worse, there were implications of what Jesus was doing. And Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, was washing his feet. What does that mean about what he needed to do? He had to make him humble himself. So he was, his pride was hurt. Jesus, when he got done, he hit Peter with a grass. When he got done, Jesus explained, Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so. That's what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set an example that you should do as I have done for you. This was the last day of Jesus' life on earth. And he was teaching his disciples the most important lessons that they needed to learn. And one of those central lessons was about service, humble service. So the issue wasn't that we should wash everyone's feet still, because the, the cultural expression of servanthood has changed over the years. That was a, something a servant would do back in the day when people used sandals and walk in dusty roads. And there's more than dusty roads, of course. And so they would they'd wash the master's feet. But it was a humbling service. So the point is that we need to gladly lower ourselves to serve others. And the believers that are most mature aren't those that have the most knowledge, so they usually have good knowledge. But there are people that they, they've learned to serve. They feel superior to no one, like Jesus. In another place, uh, Jesus said to his disciples, and remember, Peter was present in all these situations. Whoever wants to become great at all, you must be your servant. This is Matthew chapter 20, verse 26 and following. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Many years later, Peter, now the wise and older apostle, is reflecting back on his experiences with Jesus and he's sharing with his leaders the critical importance of humility. We need to clothe ourselves with humility. Now before we go on, I need to talk a little bit about what humility is because it's often misunderstood. True humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. True humility isn't thinking less of yourselves, but thinking of yourself less, less often. Humility it doesn't mean saying, ah, I'm worthless, I'm of no value, I have nothing to give. Because none of that is true. The fact of the matter is, you're of infinite value as one who's made in the image of God. And God has given every believer gifts to contribute to the body of Christ and the ministry. Now, humility is embracing your value and all that God has given you, but acknowledging that it all comes as a gift from God. And so we don't have anything to boast about. The only thing we have to boast about is all that Jesus has done for us and God's goodness and love. We recognize the source of all that we have. In his book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness, Tim Keller writes, the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. See, the humblest people don't spend time comparing themselves with others. Because that requires them to think about themselves and self focus And when we do that, we'll always end up either thinking more of ourselves in pride, or thinking less of ourselves, but they're both functions of pride. And they don't talk about their accomplishments or bemoan their lack thereof. The humble person's focus isn't on self at all, it's on others. Loving them, honoring them, serving them, 
showing genuine interest in that. I've met great Christians who were well known, who were true people of humility. And the thing that often stood out was their interest in me. Who am I? The focus was on others in love. Now, those who humble themselves, the Bible tells us here, will experience God's favor. Why should we humbly serve, put that slave's towel around us, and do that dirty work, washing feet, and not try to lift ourselves up? Well, it's because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. If we exalt ourselves, God will oppose us. If we humble ourselves, God will lift us up. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Luke tells a story of a time when Jesus had been invited to the home of a prominent member of the community. Luke writes, chapter 14, verse 7, When Jesus noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. In that day, in some places it's true here today, in our culture, there was a big long table at the banquets, and the closer you were to the host, the more honored you were. So people would try to get those seats first. So Jesus if someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host invited, who invited both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place because all the other seats are full. But when you were invited, take the lowest place so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. You see, when God exalts us, our place is secure, just like the man who sat in the humble place and was called to a higher place by the master of the house. Let God exalt you. When we exalt ourselves, it is so Uncertainty. The adulation of people is as transient as your breath on a cold winter's day. You know, there it is, and it's gone. Winston Churchill was once asked, Doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you make a speech, the hall is packed, overflowing? And Churchill replied, It is quite flattering. But whenever I feel that way, I always remember that instead of making a political speech, I was being hanged, the crowd would be twice as big. <laughs> the adulation of people is fleeting. Let God lift you up. It'll last. God opposes the crowd, but gives faith, shows favor to them. So the question really comes down to do I want God to oppose me? Or pour out his grace on me. If you want his grace and his favor, get low. So it's a new way of finding success, climbing to the bottom of the ladder in humility. Be the least. And let God take care of the rest. And this is interesting. Peter adds, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. In the original language, this is a continuation of the sentence before it. So the English Standard Version translates this a bit more accurately. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that in the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. This is a new command. Casting our anxieties on God is simply an expression, an integral part of humbling ourselves. See, when we're puffed up, we in lifting ourselves up, we're, we're feeling this need to control our world and to control our position and, and to control our needs. Make sure our needs get met. 
When we humble ourselves before God, we let go of that. We let go of our reputation. We let go of comparisons. We let go of trying to make people think highly of us. We let go of our control of life. We're trying to manage things. Thinking it's somehow by our own power we can get it done. Now humble yourselves before God. Cast your cares on So what's our response? Well, we take it straight from our text. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up. And that verse, uh, just restating it, Peter tells us what we should do and lift you up in his time. That the, the due time is, is his time. Peter tells us what we should do. He tells us how we should do it, and then he tells us why we should do it. I want to spend a little more time on the, the what. Very practical suggestions. These are things that will crucify your pride. And as your pride is crucified, you'll be humbled, and that will resent at least God's grace in your life. So there's actually there's nine things I'll go through them fairly quickly. Take, just think about which ones of these apply most to you. First of all, take the last seat. Don't seek the place of prominence. Don't try to exalt yourselves. We, we want to be first, or at least higher up. We want to be noticed. Don't press yourselves forward. Don't try to hang out with the rich and the popular and the important people. Hang out with the humble. Show kindness to the least. Take the last seat. Number two, serve others. Never think that a task is below you. If you're a leader, there should be nothing that you're not willing to do, that you're asking your followers to do. Jesus says, in Matthew 25, 40, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Wrap the servant's apron around you and show kindness to all, including the least, knowing that you're showing kindness to Jesus. Number three, honor others. Put others first. Romans 12, 10 says, outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another. It's like, this is the competition. I'm going to honor you more than you honor me. Is that a different way of looking at competition? Show respect to all. Give others credit. As we said, humility isn't self-loathing. It's seeing reality as it really is. And that is that we're all equals. And we all deserve the honor of people made in God's image. When you honor someone who's unimportant in the world, world's eyes, you're honoring God in whose image that person is made. And when you honor that person, you're actually honoring yourself as an image bearer of God. Honor others. Number four. Admit when you're wrong. Ouch. I didn't say this would be easy. In pride, we want to be right. It's hard to admit we're wrong, even when we know that we're wrong. Have you noticed that? <laughs> Many arguments, maybe most arguments, in marriage, with kids, with, at school, in the workplace, with friends, are often rooted in trying to prove that we are more right than they are than the other person is. Here are three short sentences that will produce more peace than you can imagine. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. That will crucify your pride. And release God's grace in your life. Number five, be teachable. We get puffed up. It's hard for us to learn, to listen to others, especially people that aren't of significance in the world's eyes. Some of the deepest truths I've learned has been from humble people who just, they're godly. Teachability is a key trait of humility. It's also a key trait of those who are growing in the Lord. Open your heart to learn, especially from those that are prominent, who will crucify your pride. <coughs> And release God's grace and enable you to grow. 
we have a men's Bible study every Friday morning. One of the things I love about that Bible study is that we all come together and no one's trying to show off. We just we recognize that we can learn from one another. There are people in that Bible study who know more about the passage that we're studying than I do. And every time, I just learn so much from these humble men. The best small groups I've ever been in are groups when people check their pride at the door. When they come in not trying to get attention to themselves, but honoring one another and listening and growing from one another. And that's essential for growth spiritually. Proverbs 19.20 says, listen to advice and accept discipline. And at the end, you will be counted among the wise. A humble person is teachable and will become wise, a mature believer. Number six, stop talking. We talk too much. Why do we talk so much? It's because we want attention, to feel better about ourselves, or sometimes we think what we have to say is more important or more right. Those are all expressions of pride. Talk less. And let others be in the spotlight. Listen. Ask questions. It'll crucify your pride and release grace. James 1 19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. The Lord help us all. Number seven, submit to authority. Peter begins our passage today by telling younger people to submit to those who are elders. We're commanded to submit to those who are in authority over us and to honor them. And doing so, it will put to pride our death to pride. We'll put our pride to death. And release God's work in our lives, whether that be at home or in school or in church or at work. And above all, of course, submit to God. Number eight, don't compare yourself with others. Rather, be thankful. Thankful for what you have. Don't, don't compare your car, your house, your boat, your wife or your husband, your kids. Rather, rejoice in exactly what God has given you. Yeah, notice this. We, we live in a neighborhood. You know, and our modest home was the nicest in the area. We feel okay. And then we moved into a house that was even nicer in a neighborhood where our house was one of the smaller in the area. And I'm just going to so It's always that comparison thing. To be thankful. That's what put to death our pride. And above all, don't compare your righteousness with the righteousness of others. That's rooted in self-righteousness and is perhaps the ugliest manifestation of pride. In Luke 18, Jesus tells this parable. Two men went up to the temple of pride, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. And all that I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Pharisee's words were filled with I. Pride just slopped from his mouth and arrogance, uh, judgment, self focused comparison. A yeah, pride filled person is always comparing and judging. <clears throat> I've done that. So, you know, right, we're all the target of this, aren't we? The humble tax collector who saw only God's holiness wasn't looking at himself except to see his own sin. He was justified. And so rid yourself of self-righteous arrogance. Get the log out of your eye. Stop judging. It'll set you free. And you'll experience God's forgiveness 
and his love, and his grace in greater measure. And finally, number nine, trust God, not self. You must realize that God is in control of the universe, not me. I don't have to run around trying to control and fix things I can't fix, control things I can't control. I looked to him, trusted him to take care of me, my reputation, my need to cast all my anxieties on him. I let go, I let God. <clears throat> Humble ourselves and cast all of our anxieties on him because he cares for us. And, and how do we this, do this humbling? We do it under God's mighty hand. When we humble ourselves, we're humbling ourselves before God. We acknowledge that he alone is God. And we're just all of us. None of us are more special in God's eyes because all of us are infinitely special in God's eyes. And why do we do this? So that God may lift us up in his time. Just as the master of the house exalted the humble man who took the last seat, it happened in its time. God, just as God justified the Tax collector who humbled himself, just as the Father exalted his Son, Jesus. You know, according to Philippians 2 6, being in the very nature of God and not considering quality of God something to be used to his own advantage. But rather, Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on the earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up. You can go to the next slide and return for that. If the command is spoken once in the Bible, we're to obey it. But the command is spoken two or three or four times or more. We need to realize this is essential at a deeper level in the Christian life. Jesus has talked about the importance of humility over and over again in his parables, in his rebukes against the Pharisees, in correcting his disciples when they strove to be first. And then in the letters that Paul and Peter and James and John wrote to the churches, every one of them talked about living humble. So here's the question. Will you hear God's word about living humbly and humble yourself so that you can release God's grace in your life? The question is, do I want God to oppose me or do I want God to pour out grace on me? And I know I need grace. And so God gave me grace to be humble. Because pride is something we all struggle with. I see it in my life. May we be like our Savior, Jesus. As we learn to live from below, we'll receive grace from on high. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves in your sight so that you might lift us up. Uh, to reveal the stench of pride that is right there. It's a process or it's a daily choosing things that crucify our pride. Lord, and release your grace. And so, Lord, let it be in our personal lives, in our families, in our church, in the church across our nation. May we clothe ourselves with humility. May people look at us and see humble people. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand as we sing in response. Oh, <laughs> 
So as we come to this table, we realize that we are participating in Christ's life, the sermon life. And the Bible tells us we participate in his death. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but he who lives in me. So as we come and partake of this powerful symbol of his broken body and his poured out blood, we allow ourselves to participate in his crucifixion. To die to our pride, to die to our sinful passions, to slip and die. That the life of Christ <clears throat> might be manifested in us. Some man, Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28, not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. As we come to this table, we come in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us in his death, his resurrection. As we come, we come recognizing He's present right now with us through His Holy Spirit. As we partake in faith, this is the body of Christ broken for us and the blood of Jesus poured out for us. Come in hope. As Jesus said, when He drank the cup, I will not drink of this through the fruit of the vine until I come again. And so it's for it's the final day when we all are at the wedding feast of the Lamb with our Lord Jesus Christ, and we're the, we're the bride. The church is the bride of Christ. In your name, in your with him forever. So here are the words, the, the institution of the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And after he broke it, he blessed it, he said, This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The bread that we break is the body of Christ broken for us. And the cup that we partake is the blood of Jesus poured out for us. I want to invite the servers to come forward. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the joy of his resurrection, and the hope of his coming again in glory. And we will share his glory. And so, Lord, we present ourselves as a living sacrifice. As we partake of this bread, we crucify our pride and our self, selfish flesh and sinful bonds, that your life might be manifest in us. As we partake of this cup, may we receive afresh the cleansing of the blood of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So we believe that this, these realities that the Lord is present to help us experience his crucifixion and resurrection, to help us experience the fresh, his cleansing blood. And so everyone is welcome to come to this table. If you're, uh, whether you're part of this congregation or not, 
It's a table of coming to Jesus to receive. Uh, some people in the past have thought, well, I've, I've just sinned, or you know, maybe I sinned this morning on the way to church, I had an argument or something. So I'm not worthy to come. Well, none of us are worthy. If you have sin in your life, you should be ready to the table to receive this cleansing from our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the bread and cup physically that do it. It's the presence of Christ through the partaking that does the life-giving work and the cleansing work. And so come as you're ready. We'll come down the, the middle aisle, and then you'll be served. As you come up to the, the servers. The server will, will take bread, dip in the cup, and hand it to you. They're well wearing gloves, so you want to be clean. Um, so you're clean. And uh, they go just around the outside, and then you can go back to your seats. Um, there is gluten-free. Is there gluten-free bread? Not today. Not today, sorry. They're tiny pieces. Uh, so, what's that? They're tiny pieces. They're, they're tiny pieces. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and also, if you'd like to partake, um, one of these little cups, <laughs> uh, they're available for you, or if you, there's someone who can't come forward, you can take that back to them to receive it in their seat. Well, now I'll serve the servers and myself as we begin to just play and you can play music and just begin to prepare your hearts and enjoy the Lord's presence in this time. <laughs> Thank you. 
service will have service up here in the front for those who may not have been able to be served yet. <clears throat> Let's praise the Lord. Praise the Lord of my soul. And all that is within me, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord of my soul, forgetting all his benefits, who forgives all your sins, who heals all your diseases, who delivers your life from the pit, who crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so high is this love of the Lord towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Thank you for your love and your compassion. And uh, fill us with your spirit. In the humility of our Savior Jesus Christ. In his life. And may we live with you forever in glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. This all seen together, I have decided to follow Jesus to stand to you in worship. at 6 p.m. tonight for the community worship service. Uh, join us at the gathering place. And also, don't forget to sign up for the dessert at uh, 10 a.m. in my home. Uh, and that sign up will be
available for several weeks to come if you need to check your calendar. Let's receive this blessing from First Thessalonians. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Amen. Go in his peace.